Definitely in residency, I remember. I would literally call you, I would say hello, and you would start yelling. Why are you yelling at me? So being the person that I am. You see how she's gonna try to paint herself as the <laughs> yeah, there saint? You go. There you go, I am a saint. Put that halo up, Alfred. Being the person that I am, I recognized that something had changed about you. It wasn't just, oh, he's being an asshole. You did like, think that though. Well, I did think you were being an asshole. I mean, that that's, that's, that's what it was. This episode is brought to you by Set for Life Insurance. Listen, docs, one of the first steps we took to pay off our student loan debt was realizing we paid way too much for our disability insurance. That all changed when we found Set for Life Insurance. They helped us with a customized insurance policy that met our needs and most of all, budget. To learn more, check out setforlifeinsurance.com. Did you know Locum's docs make on average 33% more than employed docs? Got your attention now? So if you're considering Locum tenants, either full-time or on the side, you probably have a question or two or maybe even 20. Locumstory.com is packed with unbiased information and tools to see what the trends are in your specialty and even make a decision if Locums is right for you. My advice, make Locumstory.com the go-to place to learn more about Locum tenants. That's Locumstory.com. What's good, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Docs Outside the Box. You we got are good joined. audio today. We got good audio <laughs> I did my sound check. I'm tired as you know what. I am post post call from doing what five, six nights of of what night shift. Yeah. Sorry, I, I messed up your introduction. That's okay. <laughs> I'm your boy Dr. Nee. I'm joined by Dr. Renee. Well, you know. The audio was the audio was like so bad last time that I just had to do like a little video before to let people know, but I triple checked. The audio's working. <laughs> Alfred, we got you. Thank you very much. And we're also recording on these mics. Yes, which would have saved us the last time. But I didn't want to listen and I'm hard headed. Yeah. I'm very difficult to deal with. I can't understand that. Oh my God. Thank yeah. goodness we are recording. It takes, it takes a certain person to Every do with me. single time we I'm get highly into driven. it, every single time we get into it, I'm going to play the beginning of this episode. I can understand. I'm highly driven. I know highly that. Highly driven. But no, now you walking it back to like, oh, I have leadership qualities. Like when they ask you like, single what's, a, purpose. what's your weakness? Well, you I know my too weakness, many I, I care too much. <laughs> Shut up. I think you're putting on for the pod right now. I'm not. What's good, everyone? How's everybody doing? <laughs> I hope you guys are doing okay. Wherever you're listening to this podcast, if you're watching us on YouTube, what's up? What's the vibes? If you're listening to us on the audio version, what's good? What's the vibes? I'm excited here. Um, YouTube. But listen, you know, if you're listening to this only, just know that there's an audio, or excuse me, there's a video component of this um, where, you know, our video uh, editor, Alfred does an amazing job and um, he really kind of puts everything together. Yeah. So if you're listening and you want to kind of get a different feel, check us out on YouTube and uh, give us a like and a what? Subscribe? A Hit the subscribe. subscribe. Yes, Hit for the sure. subscribe button so that you know you know and you're up to date with all the different episodes that we're coming out with. And sometimes we live stream and it'll be cool. Sometimes we do. For you to get a notification and say, hey, listen, Docs Outside the Box are streaming and we're recording this on June 6th. 9.56 at night. Like I said, I'm tired and I'm just talking. Yo, what's up, everybody? Let's, let's, let's jump. get into let's it, jump. please. What are we talking about today, Dr. Let's, nee? let's talk about what we got to talk about today, which um, actually is not... I mean, this is something that is really serious. This is something that you had to be living under a rock to find out about. Um, but roughly about two weeks ago, on May 26th, um, uh, we found out that Dr. Nikita Mortimer, who is an anesthesiology resident at Montefiore Medical Center... Um, that she passed away, she committed suicide. It's made its way through social media for so many different reason, reasons. Um, obviously, the most important thing is that she, you know there's a young doctor, a sister, um, you know, a daughter, mm -hmm. uh, a friend, um, a Haitian American, mm -hmm. union organizer at Montefiore Actually, Medical Haitian Center. Haitian because she, I believe, was born in Haiti. Okay. Mm -hmm. I believe so. She's a union organizer at uh, Montefiore Medical Center as a first year, you know, which is a big deal. Mm -hmm. 
Um, she passed away on May 26th. If you go to some of the posts by some of her friends, there's one post by Dr. Rahima. I'm, her last name is Dr. Rahima Thomas. Mm. She is a PGY1. She's radiation oncology. She put out there that uh, Dr. Nikita was a lover of Afrobeats, Caribbean music. She was an advocate. She was an active member of SNMA. And as a matter of fact, one of the pictures that's circulating, and there's a lot of pictures that are circulating mm -hmm. on Twitter, as well as Instagram, but there's one picture of her, Dr. Nikita, and Dr. Rahima, where they are at an SNMA conference. It mm -hmm. looks like it's the SNMA conference in Orlando, mm -hmm. which was two last, years ago. Last year? Two years ago? Two years ago. Right, no. Last which was year. last year. That was last year. Last year. We were there, mm -hmm. and there's these long hallways um, where the conference is at. I forget where, it's in Orlando, but yeah, I forget the name of the conference. Yeah, resort. In it. Yeah, I forget the name of the resort, but yeah. But that, when I saw that picture, I was like, wait, I was chasing my kids down that same hallway. Mm -hmm. So basically, you never know. We might have been walking. We made it past there a million times. In the same room, the energy. Yeah. It's just, man, this stuff um, really hits home, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and... Um, it's, it's a lot. You know, I can imagine, um, you know, what the family's gone through. And just from this podcast to them, obviously, you know, they want privacy uh, at this moment. But definitely we're just sending all love to that family, the support that we can give in this situation. Um, but I've been also reading some of the messages from Dr. Rahima. Dr. Rahima said, listen, like, continue. If you guys want to continue her fight, continue to be an advocate for residents, continue to be an advocate for doctors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I've also seen some people go, like, completely, you know, from zero to 100 with their posts and, mm -hmm. and talks about how residents are treating and doctors are treated and so forth. And then, you know, there's kind of more of the same and so forth. So, you know, I wanted to have a discussion today about um, the effects of residency on mental health, the effects of just being a doctor in general on mm -hmm. mental health. Let's get into like, you know, like a real talk. Like, let's just like, for real, let's pod yeah. about this and stuff because, you know, it's um, it's a thing. It's a, it's, it's... Um, well, I think, you know, one of the things that is important to know is that approximately um, 300 or so, and I believe the number might be increasing, but... 300 or so um, physicians or people who are very um, adjacent to our profession um, unfortunately die by suicide every yeah. year, oh, you yeah. know, which is very um, just jarring and upsetting. Um, but I think it's important for people to just kind of know that particular statistic um, because I think it, it does say something about just kind of the climate. I'll, I'll keep it at that, right? Oh, the, yeah. the climate of just medicine. I didn't know you were going to jump to those numbers because I got studies mm -hmm. that show here. So first of all, just so if anybody's listening to this right now and you are not familiar with the medical field, you are either dating someone, right, or mm -hmm. you are married to someone, just so you know, like this topic of depression suicide in medicine, whether it's doctors, whether it's medical students, whether it's nurses, this is something that has been documented for a long time. I'm yeah. talking about before 2000s. We talking about the you know, 1950s, 60s, 70s. The, the rate of depression, the rate of suicide is higher, particularly in doctors, mm -hmm. particularly in medical students and residents compared to the general population. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about three times to four times more prevalent in our population. Mm -hmm than in the general population. There's a study right now that says that basically there's one study that shows that the prevalence of depression among among residents can be as high as 28%, mm. maybe even higher. My goodness. Right? And a lot of them develop depression symptoms after the start of residency, right? So a lot of these uh, these one-liners that I'm getting are from, stud are from studies that I'm going to put in the show notes, right? So wait, so say that last part again. What starts in residency? A lot of them develop depression symptoms after the start of residency. Mm. So the 28% of depression, the 28% of residents... That's who, what they report. Who, ...who report that they feel like they are depressed. Mm -hmm. the majority of them, The majority of them had their depression system start after mm. residency. And as That's you know, that in, after the start of residency. Right. 
Right. right. So we talk about intern year. There's studies that show that like intern year specifically, mm-hmm. it's that that is the trigger that gets a lot of people down that path that they can't recover from. Mm. You saw me, my intern year. I saw you, your intern year. So we know. Another study, this is by Medscape, says about one fourth of physicians reported clinical depression. One fourth. These are this is like doctors who are out there mm-hmm. in the wild, academic doctors, uh, doctors who are community based. Nine percent of them admitted to suicidal thoughts, mm. and one percent of them have tried to commit suicide. Interesting. Oh yeah. So. You know, they, like I said, I could continue to keep going through all the this, this studies and so forth, but they speak for themselves. And the issue is, is that, you know, depression, suicide is rampant or, excuse me, is a big deal in our community. And before we go down like a certain rabbit, rabbit hole, I got so many thoughts. I got so many questions in my mind. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, if the later on in the show I want to kind of express you know my thoughts on my feelings in residency because I feel like I at one point was kind of close to that you know yeah. I think definitely in residency I remember just you being so let, let's back up a little bit because so I knew you your you know all four years of medical school right and you know, you had a certain personality about yourself, and so I was very used to that. But in residency, that personality, like, that wasn't you. Like, that really, like, pray I was t- like... Pray, so the, explain it so people so, can understand. So I would literally call you on a random day, and you would, I would say, hello, and you would start yelling, like, just randomly yelling at me and I'm like why are you yelling at me like what's the problem yeah whatever so being the person that I am <laughs> y'all hear this y'all? you see how she's gonna try to paint herself as the yeah, there saint you go. there you go I am a saint put that halo up Alfred um <laughs> no but you know be, being the person that I am you know I I recognized that something had changed about you. It wasn't just, oh, he's being an asshole. He's just doing this. He's just doing that. You did like, think that, though. I, well, I did think you were being an asshole. I mean, that that's, that's, <laughs> that's what it was. It's not that you weren't being an asshole, but I could have stopped there, right? I could have just stopped there and been like, ah, he's just being an asshole. But I realized that you were going through a lot of stress, especially in that first year, because... There was a whole categorical versus prelim. Oh, yeah, man. Let's, let's, and let's, you let's, were, yeah. let's, you know, you were trying to keep that spot. And let's, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. The competition. Let's talk about it. Yeah, so, guys, my, so I'll, I'll leave it to you like this. The stress that I felt my intern year, I'd say a, a portion of it was a chip on my shoulder that I put there because I was their first DL resident ever, mm-hmm. right? And then, you know, it's just in general, it's a smaller program. Um, we're in a program, we're in a hospital that we're sharing uh, the hospital with a larger hospital or with a larger, larger medical, medical school, uh, Emory and so forth. So we were in Morehouse and we're sharing with Emory. So, you know, there's that, okay, you got to show up and, you know, you really want to make sure you take care of great patients because, you know, you got that, you know, gaze of the other program that's much bigger mm-hmm. and more renowned than you guys. You guys don't want to mess up and so forth. Right. Um, but I just remember like, I just remember getting to the hospital and know, thinking, okay, I got to be there at like four in the morning. Mm-hmm. Round start at like seven. Right. Or sorry, round start at six. Morning Where report starts at seven, seven. Right. So I got to be there at four in the morning. And I would get there at four in the morning and I would round and I would get all the information and I would perfect my, my presentations so that, you know, I didn't want anybody to have to say anything bad about me because I just kind of felt like it was literally an imposter syndrome, right? Mm-hmm. They're going to find out that I'm a DO medical student or they're going to give me a hard time about You're a, a resident at that point. I'm a, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm a B. Uh, the, the problem is I'm a C. You know, I, I, I just, I had this perfectionist or perfectionist, uh, perfectionism was a part of my, mm-hmm. which, that was my answer to get through the stress, basically. Yeah, and which as is result, a fast Fast. Yeah. So fast I kept piling too. on and piling on and piling on the stress. You know, if there was an issue, then the issue is, well, you got to study harder. You got to get to the hospital more. Why are you trying to sleep? We may want to sleep from like 
11 o'clock until 4. Right. Right? Like, there were times when I would wake up at, like, I'd go to bed by midnight at times if mm -hmm. I got home. I would wake up at, like, 2 in the morning, mm -hmm. like, in a pool of sweat, right? Because I was just stressed about what's going to happen in the next two hours. Mm -hmm. Then driving through traffic, you know, on I-20, trying to get through the I-20 traffic, trying to get to Grady, you know, so that there's no issues whatsoever. Because if you missed it just by a little bit, there was a bunch of traffic. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, getting there by 4 o'clock, it wasn't a major issue. Right. But every now and then, you know, there's a shift that, you know, you have to get there that right. early. But you just want to make sure that, you, you know, you're there right. on time. And, yeah, like my personality changed big time. Because I, I, it, it became so, I was so defensive all the time. Like, mm -hmm. I just was like, what are you going to say now? Who's going to say this? I'm, I'm doing this wrong. I got to make sure that, you know, I can, you know, think three steps ahead of you before. And that drove me nuts. nuts. Yes. I remember there was one point, there was a point where I, I don't think I was taking showers. Mm -hmm. there was this, I remember I was like, yo. Because you just, you get up at four, you get home by 11 maybe. Realistically, you get, those were those were few and far between. But you get home like definitely around eight o'clock. Mm -hmm. Then you got to study. You got to eat dinner. You got to take a shower. You like there's just what are you gonna be able to do? You want to talk to family. You want to talk to your girlfriend. Like you know, like me and you were going through our stuff. You know, and mm -hmm. it was tough. I had yeah. to get ready for boards. You know, app site. Yep. I wasn't doing well on that. Yeah. Then I'm in a I'm in a city that I'm not very familiar with. Although it's Atlanta, it's amazing. To me, it was just it, first year was not fun at all in Atlanta. Well, I think part of it also was that remember when we when we got to Kansas City, one of the first things that we had said, especially you, you were hell bent on going back home. So you were like, I'm only going to do two years in Kansas City. And I'm going back to Irvington. Remember, you used to say that all the time. Shout out to Irvington. Third year came, third year of yeah. medical school came, you were in the MBA program. And what didn't you do? Yeah, that wasn't Go an option. Go back home. That it wasn't, wasn't an option. option. You had to stay in Kansas City. By the time fourth year came around, you were bouncing, you know, around the country a little bit. Got to go doing home. Doing eyes yeah. Right. Got to go home a little bit. But I think once you did the match and it came down to being... 45 minutes away from home or a three, 45 minute drive away from home versus a three hour, two hour to three hour plane ride. I think that probably, and I don't know if that affected you, but I know that that was something that I often thought about that you wanted to get home and you could never get there. Right, that was the that was the issue. So the pro so there was two programs that I was looking at. One of them was Morehouse. Mm -hmm. Morehouse was always my number one choice. Mm -hmm. Right. The thing though with Morehouse was and the second choice was a place that was like forty five minutes from home. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of giving a little bit of the edge to the place that was closer to home because I just wanted to come home. Right. I just wanted to be around family and so forth. Even though the better program was Morehouse. Mm -hmm. Shout out to y'all. And I got in and so forth. So when I was there, there was always this feeling of I always felt like the additional stress of I turned my back against my family. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm not there. I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, in I'm not incorporated in the everyday goings of what's going on in my family because I'm strung literally strung out yeah. trying to survive. Yeah. You know? And so people who are not in school, people who don't understand this, like the issue here that we talk about, and it's not just me, you went through this also, but the issue is I think is residency, right? So there's many years of sacrifice and training. There's long hours. There's a lot of times people say that there's lack of support mm -hmm. among your fellow residents. Mm -hmm. A lot of times there's lack of support from you as a resident to your attendings, right? There's a lot of bureaucracy that you got to deal mm -hmm. with that oftentimes supersedes just even just clinically taking care of your patient. Right. Right. There's scut work that you got to do that right. is uninspiring. You Sometimes gotta, you're like, am I actually learning anything or am I just working? <laughs> pu push your patient here, take your patient there, <laughs> do blood draws, right? Yeah. Some of the things that we talked about, unions, right. you know, some people unions, who want to start yeah. unions at certain hospitals and so forth. Um, and then there's also the maintaining the status quo. Right. And what I mean by that is you can tell an attending, hey, I'm having a hard time or why does this why does this situation why do we have to do this thing the same way all the time and their answer is going to be well that's the way i train that's the way i so train so that's the way you, you have train. to train yeah. right so those are some of the issues that i think that residents go through mm -hmm. and pile on like for you 
like I don't think your personality changed, but I definitely noted that you were not the same, right? And I noted that I mean, as a matter, let's leave it like this: you almost left your program. Yes. Yes. So I think my coping mechanism was definitely different from yours. Um, you know, I I think first of all, I think my personality just doesn't allow for people to I don't like when people have control over me. Yeah, man. That's speak on that. <laughs> speak on that. I don't like yeah. when people have control over yeah. me. Um, but there is also a piece of me that's like, I'm a risk taker. I'm like, I don't care. I'll leave and I'll figure it out. I'm a smart lady. Mm -hmm. Your pendant is coming on your microphone. You know, I'm like, I'm a smart lady. I'll figure it out. Like, you know, I, I, I went through medical school. You know, if I was smart enough to get into medical school, go through medical school, then I could figure this thing out. Even though I'm, you know, even if I have to leave this program, I will figure so by, it out. So by taking a risk, you're saying that, just tell us, tell like, be specific about the risk that you were taking. So the risk that I was taking was that I was actually leaving my program and not having a program to go to, right? Oftentimes when people leave. Well, why, why did you want to leave your program? So I wanted to leave my program because I felt like it was toxic. Mm -hmm. I felt like the, you know, that the program was toxic. My seniors at the time, many of my seniors at that time, um, just were, they were toxic. You know, things like, for example, um, can't go to the bathroom. Can't go to the bathroom. Yeah. I'd be like, hey, I need to just go to the restroom real quick. No, but there's this patient. Like, is she delivering right now? That, like, that would be a problem. Are you for kidding me? me? That would be a major problem. Or, for me. hey, I'm going to just go downstairs and grab a bite to eat. Yeah, but you need to watch the strips. There's like 15 freaking nurses here. Like, I don't understand why I can't go down. For five minutes, I will literally eat in front of the strip. What's the problem? It's a control thing. I got to control It's a control you. thing, right? If, you, if, how like, you gonna eat, if I don't eat, how are you going to eat? No, or no, no. They never, were eating. And then they they want were you to eat. eating, yes. Yeah, that's a control thing. They were eating. They would take the other intern, because there were like two interns, um, two interns on the OBGYN service combined. And so they would take the other intern and go down to eat with her and not allow me to eat. Now, I have my thoughts as to why that is, but I digress. See the, I don't other... See, the thing I don't understand about you, you say that you don't like people to have control over you, no, right? No, I don't. But how do you stand for that? Because I would not stand for that. I'd be like, you know me already. Like, that, like for me, so... I, don't like, I don't like when people have, when they try to make it as basic as you can't eat. What do you mean I can't eat? So... So, like, nah, I'm going to eat and I'm so, going to eat in front of you because you can't tell me. But anyway, go ahead. So, so herein lies the problem, right? right? Because on an ordinary day, in an ordinary situation, that would have been my response. However, in a situation where I have to weigh, is it really worth it for me to have this fight so that I can eat and potentially put my career in jeopardy? Because these yeah. people who are three years ahead of me and have, you know, and, and basically are in the know with the attendings can literally say whatever they want about me. And then that could affect my entire yeah. career. Right. So I was like, <clears throat> let's see, I can either give them the occasion to kick me out or I could just leave. Like there literally is nothing holding me here except for me. Like, so technically, I am the one in control. And if I engage in this back and forth with them, then all of a sudden, I give them the control. So how long were you contemplating, yo, I'm about to be out? So I contemplated leaving for about three months. Oof. So when, when the year rolled around, I was like, yeah, I don't know about this. And I need, to, I need to say that there were two other residents in my cohort who actually left our residency program. Did it say, I was the did it, third. Did it say, and so, it was because it was toxic. So three. Re, so if you three had left, residents, if you had left, been. that would have been three residents who left. Yeah. So the other two who left, did they go into other residencies or they didn't know where they were going? No, they went into other residencies. These are interns or interns in my cohort that year. How many interns in your school? We how had. Many? We started with six. Damn. We started. So with it would have been three. <laughs> yes. 
my program director, when I handed him that paper, oh. that resignation letter, he was he literally snatched it from me. He was like, wham. But well, when you but when you look back, it's like, bro, why are you snap why are you snatching this for? I, Obviously it's something that you are doing as to the reason why I'm leaving. Or not doing. Or not doing. Right? But this or is not your, doing. But this is but your this fault. Is your program. And this is happening under your nose. Exactly. I don't know. So, you know, back then you kind of like, oh, I'm letting this person down. It's like, nah, and now you look back, you're like, right. no, nah, bro, you were at, letting me down. At, at that point, I, I really, so you you know me, right? right? You know me. Me, I'm always like, I choose who I need to make happy. None of those people were on my list. None of those people were on my list. I'm like, I'm not going to stay here for you. And if that means that I have to leave in order to gain back my control, because technically I am in control of this. So with- I just don't want you to think that I can just give you the control and now you can manipulate this situation to basically kick me out. You're not kicking me out. I'm going to leave. So what was the straw that broke the camel's back? The, ah, I got a colloquialism right. Look at that. Yeah, you did. Yeah, I got it right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I don't remember if there was a straw that broke the camel's back more than it was just, I felt like, I don't have to stand for this. Yo, so for, our, so for just like, I don't know if you remember, but you were telling me about this before you did it. I was like, mm. she ain't leaving. Where are you going to go? Because I remember I kept asking, I'm like, aren't you looking at other programs? You're like, no. And I'm like, she ain't leaving. Like, there's no way you're going to leave a program and not have another program to go oh, through. yeah. And then you're like, yeah, I submit. I think you showed me the letter first, or you submit. I, yep, I submitted that letter with with not. I didn't even apply to another program. Yeah, we got to find that letter. I didn't even. Uh, I I'd have to look for it, but I didn't even apply to another program. I didn't even apply. So so, what part of the year did you submit your letter? It was March. Damn. It was March, and I had to finish out my three months. Mm-hmm. You know, to to end you know my contract, and um. But during that time, everybody left me alone. After you submitted your submit. After I submitted it, and all the toxicity just literally dissolved. They weren't interested in me anymore. I wasn't the prey anymore because they were like, eh, she's not staying. So they literally just left me alone for three months. Mm. They left me alone. And again, the only reason I ended up staying was because my, the program um, chair, excuse me, the chair of my department actually ended up asking me to stay. And he was somebody that I actually did respect. And I was like, you know what? I will stay. And especially because... You should have been like, I will stay, but you got to knock out that resident, that <laughs> resident, no, that because resident. That's what I would have done. So at Target that, on you, target on... The, yeah. <laughs> no, at that point, no. Because you got to understand, when the dynamic changed, so did I, right? Because at first it was, I don't have to stand for this. I'll just leave. Then it was, oh, so y'all leaving me alone. So this is, y'all just want to be all toxic. So I basically gained my confidence back and I was just doing my thing. And so now it was, I'm going to go downstairs and get something to eat. Mm -hmm. Because I can go downstairs and get something to eat. You guys don't even care if I go out downstairs to go get something to eat anymore. So that's what happened. I literally changed the dynamic of how people people <laughs> approach me. But here's here's the thing that I'm confused about. So okay, so okay, Mar- you submitted your letter of resignation in March. Mm-hmm. When did you they when did you have that talking to with the chairperson? Um, I probably but had how does that turn talking- into an interview about you, man? <laughs> you supposed to interview me? I, no, I pr- I probably had it. I want to say maybe in May. Okay, in May, and then you rescinded your letter. When- yeah. I rescinded my letter soon after that. It, I thought it, about it for like two weeks. Because toxicity kind of flows downhill, right? So mm-hmm. if your seniors are toxic, right? And mm-hmm. say their names. You want to say their names? I don't even remember Come their on, names. let's call them out. Come on, that's what we pod for. No. <laughs> I would call them out. I don't even remember their names, to tell you the truth. So that's literally, I really don't. I don't even you, remember their names. You're lying. For the state of the I'm podcast, not. you are I lying. I really don't remember their names. She knows their names. Their names. No, she I ain't don't. trying to say their names. If, you, if I saw their names, I would remember. But if I, if I had to remember, you don't understand. When I tell you that people people are not that important to me, when okay. you're not that important to me, I don't right, keep right, you in my head. All right, like let's that. move on. All right, let's move on. So, I mean, like I said, so that toxicity is hard. So, just because the seniors aren't talk are gone, doesn't mean that your junior or the you know like the no, third but years, my dynamic, and second years, but my dynamic changed. Mm-hmm. Right, it changed me. It changed the way that I navigated through the situation. Right, like that was really important to me. 
right, is that I needed to navigate. I didn't need people to navigate me. I didn't need people to control me. I didn't need people to puppeteer me. What I needed was, dude, I'm doing my work. You know, I'm doing my work and I don't need your praise. I definitely don't need your praise. If I'm doing something good, you want to tell me, okay, great. But if I'm doing something that's not, you know, that's not up to par, I do need to, I do need you to tell me that as well. But what I don't need is for you to berate me and I don't need you to disrespect me because I'm not going to stand for that. Mm. And so once the dynamic changed with them leaving me alone, I realized I got carte blanche to do whatever I want. These people literally mm. could care less. Right. They like they couldn't care less okay. that I, you know, that they weren't controlling me anymore. All right. We get that point. Now. So but on. I did want to I did want to just kind of talk a little bit um, about just personalities and whether or not. Well, hold on before you even get down. That yeah. Yeah. Yeah, remember who's in who's the who's, the, who's, the, who's, the, who's the host? Are you, do you feel in charge? I, I do feel in charge. Do you? Do, do you feel in charge? I do feel in charge. I do feel in charge. <laughs> so real quick, because some people may be like, "Well, what's the big deal?" Um, when you have depressed doctors, there's plenty. Like I said, all of this stuff is all studied out. Right? Mm -hmm. But when you have depressed doctors, there's studies that show that there's poor patient care. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's more medical errors. You have burnout, and then as we said in this case. Um, Suicide. Yeah, suicide. The suicide mm -hmm. is an issue. Um, and then, you know, some of the things that people talk about is there's like this stigma that folks have. Like, I can't talk to my colleagues yeah. about having depression or colleagues don't feel comfortable calling it out or saying, you know, talking to that person who mm -hmm. they're suspicious about um, or just feel like mm, that person's not right. Right. You know, and, and sometimes you just can't tell because. Yeah. You know, people are very good at, I don't want to say hiding, because I don't know that people actually hide. I think their, we're bad at recognizing it, unless it's like really out in the open. Yeah, but, you know, I, I also I also think that there is a component of, um, you know, a functionally being depressed, right? Like that you, you can function. So like a functional alcoholic? Right, like so someone who, who is very highly functional and doesn't necessarily you know, show outward signs of depression in the way that we, at least the way we think and in the way that we're trained um, about depression, right? Usually you think of, you know, the anhedonia, like, oh, you don't care about anything anymore, right? But that doesn't usually show up, at least not blatantly, um, in, a, in a lot of people. And I would dare say <laughs> probably in, in medicine, we don't really see that anhedonia the way that we would maybe with other populations, I don't right. know. I think the, one of the things that really, you know, you look back and you see residents who either, you know, we put them down as they can't cut it, or, you mm -hmm. know, maybe they don't come in early, or maybe they don't stay late, or maybe it's they're the not subtleties. doing well. It's the certain subtleties that yeah. you see. Now look, there's some shitty ass residents, let's be mm -hmm. honest, right. but also there's some, I mean, a lot of times, what you may deem as someone being a poor resident is really a reflection of the fact that, you know, they may be going through something. Mm -hmm. Whatever it may be, obviously you can't clinically diagnose someone right now, right. but they may be going through some something right now. And I think a lot of times, though, we as residents or back in residency, I remember there's this tendency to harp on those behaviors, yeah. right? That toxic toxicity, like you made yeah. one mistake and now we're, we're going to stay on you. Right. And it could be a very minor mistake. And I think a lot of people who are not in medicine don't understand, like, the, the, the gravity of mistakes that you make can end up with someone dying, right? Right. And then when something as small as, you know, just coming in late maybe, mm -hmm. or just, you know, not signing your name or not doing a discharge summary, mm -hmm. then you start to develop this, this, um, this reputation and people can harp on you over yeah, and over, over and over, over again. Over. Yeah. I know that for me in residency, because like I said earlier, because I was so like, I'm gonna make sure that nobody has anything to say about me, I'm gonna become so perfect that nobody can say anything about me, that is toxic in, in itself. Yeah, That was something that I look back on, I'm like, wow, like it just set me up on this like, this feedback loop that I couldn't recover from. Mm -hmm. And it even it took me up until becoming an attending before I got off of that. Yes, it did. Right? And it, <laughs> the levels of stress, you yes, feel like did. you're constantly under the microscope, imposter syndrome, all those things kind of just follow with that because you always feel like you have this chip on your shoulder. You feel like you've never arrived. Right. And that's a feeling that I just, I would never ever trade that feeling again. 
yeah. um, you know, just to make sure that nobody can critique you. Well, I think so then that goes to what I was talking about with personalities or traits or qualities, characteristics, whatever, you know, whatever word is most appropriate. I'm not quite sure. But, you know, I work with pre-meds and I will tell you, I know where you're going to go with this. I'm, I'm very, I'm actually very shocked at the thing that you quoted with residents reporting that depressive symptoms start after the start of residency. I'm actually very shocked about that. Considering the number of pre-meds that I work with, I can tell you, now I cannot clinically diagnose. You, you should know, not clinically diagnose. Right, and I'm saying I, I literally cannot. Especially as an OB. Right. I, well, no, I, I do. I <laughs> I'm, do just, I'm just messing with you. I do uh, diagnose depression, at least postpartum. But anyway, um, I cannot and I do not and I should not clinically diagnose anyone with depression. But I will tell you that there have been many a pre-med that I have worked with over the years, over the 20 plus years that definitely give me some sort of, um, let's just say vibe, um, that isn't quite not depressive. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the other day I was talking with a pre-med and she was telling me that she wants to take the MCAT, but she isn't quite ready because her practice scores aren't where they need to be. And we started talking about, you know, what are some of the other things that she has going on that will, you know, potentially kind of impact her ability mm. to study for the MCAT. And in not a so unusual way, um, this happened, but she starts crying. And the reason I say this is not unusual is because when I speak to pre-meds, I swear to you, there's at least, I, I wish I would document this, there's got to be at least 25% of the pre-meds that I speak to cry on the first time that I speak to them. So that's what, I, I think I know where you're going with this, and that's actually, so I wrote down some thoughts about mm -hmm. this stuff, and the number one thought that I have fundamentally, I mentioned it earlier when I was describing what's the issue of residency, but fundamentally is the issue how we're trained? Right, like how right. the training occurs right. in right. medical school and also residency, or is it the type of people who are attracted to medicine? I think it's I a, think that's where I, you're leading. Are you yeah, I think do it's you a, think it's, it's a, a you think it's the latter? No, I think it's a combination of both. Yeah, yeah obviously that's what I, I think. I think it's a combination of both. I think that medicine attracts people who put a lot of pressure on themselves. Type A individuals. Right. Very type A individuals who are, you know, potentially prone to experiencing depression and anxiety because of perfectionism. You know, perfectionism is a fast path to destruction because we cannot be perfect, but we are in a field that requires perfection because like you said, if we are not perfect, that literally could mean someone could die if we are not perfect, right? So now, you know, do you think that applies just to, do you think that's just for doctors or is that for all, all healthcare professionals? Because I really it, feel like it's just for doctors. I think it's mo mainly for doctors because being a doctor, we know, and so does the rest of medicine, that the buck stops with us. We know that. Yeah, I, I, I can agree with you there. Right? Yeah. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, that's not to remove any responsibility or liability or the feeling of obligation from other healthcare professionals. But I think that there's this arm's length that potentially um, other healthcare professionals have because they know the, the buck stops yeah, with I mean, the doctor. Yeah, I mean, you're making the final decision. Right. So ultimately, if you're going to be able to make the final decision, that means you have the final responsibility. Exactly. And if everything goes great, you're going to get all the adulation. All the glory. And if everything right. goes wrong, you're going to get, gonna all, get all, all the critique yep. and stuff. Exactly. That is a very stressful place to be. Yeah. I think that's a very stressful place. And I think yeah. I agree also that I think that it is a combination of how we are trained. Mm -hmm. Starting, I think people don't mention it too. I, I tried to look up studies to see the rates of depression in pre-meds. Mm -hmm. I couldn't really find anything right. um, of that. But I do think some of that mm -hmm. type A individual doesn't, you know, is prone to do, you know, to be a perfectionist. And then the t way in which we're trained, which is stomp out creativity, no risk, follow this <laughs> and do this over and over and follow this hierarchy. 
This is the playbook. You that combination, it. <laughs> you know, can cause yeah. some things. So, um, I got a question for you about this. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about this. Well, can you ask me the question after we take a break? Uh, should we take a break? Yeah, yeah, let's take a break. All right, guys, we're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back. Backdrop, 2012, finishing my fellowship in Miami, and no decision bigger than where and how I was going to start working on my own. And there it was, the fork in the road, being employed versus something I had never heard of before, locum tenants. So I decided to go the locums route, and I had a ton of questions then. I stumbled a bit, but eventually I was able to stand on my own, and I have been working locums over the past 10 years. Now, what about you? If you're considering locums, you probably have hella questions just like I did. Like, who covers my malpractice? Do I really have control over how often I work? And what are the tax implications? Now, lucky for you, locumstory.com has the answers you need. It's packed with unbiased information and advice from docs just like you. And there's nothing to sell here. It's just a simple resource for information, like finding out what's the average pay rate for your specialty. There's even a quiz to see if locums is right for you. So listen, take my advice. Locumstory.com is the perfect place to start if you want to learn more about locums. That's locumstory.com. All right, we are back. All right, y'all, we are talking about depression, suicide in residency, as well as attendings. Um, specifically, this is sparked by uh, the recent suicide of Dr. Nikita uh, Mortimer. Unfortunately, she passed away back in um, late May. And we are talking about you know, what's going on with residency as well as um, just regular doctor life and is there something that triggers all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So the question that I have for you is that knowing what we talked about before the break, mm -hmm. the stress, the depression, um, literally there is a hazard with being a doctor, mm -hmm. right? We talk about with playing football, there is a hazard with CTE. CTE. Um, mm -hmm. There's a hazard of a whole bunch of different injuries. You know, for me, even past that, for me, the thing that I don't like about football is is there's this, like, chattel, cattle-type mentality. Mm -hmm. Right. And the ability for you to collectively bargain, the ability for you to kind of uh, unionize and speak up for yourself, I think is far weak being a football player compared to any other sport. Mm -hmm. So if I had a choice as to the sport that I'm definitely not going to allow my kids to do, it's going to be football for so many different reasons. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the main reasons is that the ability to advocate for yourself is there is none. Mm -hmm. So, um, But knowing what you know now about being a doctor, mm -hmm. And going to medical school, if the kids say they, they want to be a doctor, thoughts? Um, if my kids said that they wanted to be a doctor, I wouldn't discourage they're my, them. My kids, too. If our kids said <laughs> that they wanted to be a doctor, I wouldn't discourage them. Um, I think I would definitely have a very realistic conversation with them. And I think I would take the approach that I take with my pre meds now. And that is to say, okay, for example, the young lady that I was talking with and I said to her, because she, I won't reveal everything in the conversation, but she was all types of stress, all types of stress. And I said to her, let me ask you a question. I said, if someone decided to blacklist you and say, there is no medical school in this entire world that will take you. You will never become a doctor, ever. If that, that were to happen, what would you do? And so she just, she was shocked I was asking her this question. Now, obviously, I wasn't asking her this question because I don't think that she won't get into medical school. I think she will get into medical school. But I wanted to challenge her because she was so stressed about like getting into medical school and specifically with the situation that she had brought up to me, I wanted her to understand her value doesn't come from becoming a physician. She needed to understand that. She is a smart young lady. She can have an impact on the world in many different ways. She just chooses to do it by becoming a physician. That's good that you asked that question because I think that that message needs to be expressed to a lot of pre-meds. Um, I remember the first time I did not, the first time I applied to medical school, I did not get in and mm -hmm. I was devastated. And my college coach, I remember, asked me that question. He said, or excuse me, challenged me on that concept mm -hmm. of, 
well, why do you want to be a doctor? I want to help people. And he's like, look, there's plenty of ways that you can you help, help people. help little old ladies across the street all day. <laughs> why is it that you want to be a doctor? Mm -hmm. Right? And um, that took a long time. Mm -hmm. And it was during the time when I was kind of recrafting my um, personal statement mm -hmm. and kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do during those two years that I was off. And that question along and that challenge really helped me to understand, like you said, like there's really more to me than just an this MCAT thing. score, the right. grades that I'm going to get, Your as metrics. well as the or the, even just the pursuit of becoming a doctor. Mm -hmm. There's really more to me. Once I got that concept down, it really helped me to just be a little bit better with um, expressing myself. Right. Better with my personal statement, taking more of like a 30,000 foot view of the personal statement and how mm -hmm. I'm applying. And, you know, the whole concept of let me be more strategic as mm -hmm. opposed to let me just kind of be a victim and I'm going to submit something and let's just see what happens. And yes. that was where, you know, and I agree with you, like that's something that I think... I think a lot yeah. of people don't get in medicine. And unfortunately, I think there are so many people who actually go through pre-med, medical school, residency, and become attendings, and they still have not quite yet understood that their value isn't in the letters behind their name. That the letters behind their name is a part of who they are because they chose to do that thing, but that they are so skilled you know, and so talented that they could literally make an impact on the world in so many different ways, you know? Now, that is not to speak specifically, you know, to any physician who has unfortunately died by suicide. So I don't want anybody to think like, oh, well, you know, is she just saying that because they didn't value or whatever? That's not what I'm saying. I didn't know any of these people, so I don't want anybody to think that that's what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, is that in my experience you know, with a lot of pre-meds, they really, really, really hold their value in their metrics. And like you said, in the actual well, so pursuit. So the medical students also. Of, no, well, I, but I'm speaking specifically right. to, to pre-meds. And what I'm saying is that I, I see it starting there. I don't actually see it starting in residency. I see what you're saying. I yeah. see it starting there. So right. it would be very interesting to have a study of pre-med students, if there isn't one already, um, so if anybody knows of one, please you know send it our way. But it would be very interesting to have some sort of, you know, some sort of study of pre-meds to see like is there a report of depression. But I will tell you the the other thing of this too is that many pre-meds who are told you're never gonna make it they end up, or they think that they're never going to make it, they end up dropping out. So you don't even know who these people are. Right. There's a lot of people who, by attrition, you never know you what their rights are. You just don't even support. know who they are. Listen, so. if you're listening right now, and if you're going through it, I don't have to describe, I don't have to go any further, but if you're going through it, if there's any thoughts of hurting yourself, listen, there is a three-digit number that you can call 24-7. It's anonymous. All you have to do is dial 988 once again, that number is 988. It's there 24 hours, seven days a week. Or you can text the word TALK to 741-741. Once again, you can either call 988. That's a national line, folks. So wherever mm -hmm. you are in the United States, you call that number. They're going to connect you with someone who's actually in your region, a therapist or someone who can help talk to you um, in that region. And or you can text the word talk to seven four one seven four one, which kind of I wanted to bring that up because I also wanted to talk to people mm -hmm. that there's like so many different not so many, but there are resources out there that are anonymous mm -hmm. because that's the biggest thing is that I think the, the anonymity yeah. the anonymity is what people are looking for as well as the price possibly right. being Absolutely. a barrier and so forth. Right, because um, people don't want to put it on their insurance right. because. On YouTube, on YouTube, uh, Alfred, can you just put, there's a screenshot that I took of the resources of physicians who are having suicidal thoughts. Um, there's a screenshot that I'll put on here, but I'll also put it in the show notes also. So maybe put it on this side right here, Alfred. Um, but I agree with you, you know, that price, because what ends up happening is, mm -hmm. you know, if you use your, if you're a resident, you have health insurance. If you are a doctor, obviously you have a health insurance. And if you feel like, you know, you are having depression or you feel like you may be close to that point and you want to seek help, 
and you want to use your insurance. And it's documented. And it's documented. You feel as though that's going to hurt you. So you decide mm -hmm. not to go see someone because of that. Or you pay out of pocket if you can. Mm -hmm. And most medical students are not going to be able to afford that. Right. Medical right? students just and residents. cost yeah. prohibitive. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a major issue also. And also at the same time, like if you're a medical resident, when are you going to have time to go see one? Right. right? When are you going to have time to see a therapist? Yeah. Considering the hours that you keep. Um, it becomes very, very difficult. And so the question, you know, I, I've been having this question in my head, you know, for a long time. It's and, and the question is, when is medicine going to, you know, medicine as in medical education going to realize that this is enough of a problem that it actually is going to proactively do something about it, right? Like, you can't have, you know, 300 plus doctors literally, you know, dying and be okay with it. Like, this, this is not okay. Yeah. You know, this is not okay. So when is it that, you know, in medical education that we're going to realize that this is a problem. We literally will sit through an M&M or, you know, a Grand Rounds and we will talk out all of the all mental health issues. And, but you, you know, know, but you we'll, know, a lot of them, they're going to push back and say, so when is where is I mean, we went to the NRMP. Right. The National right. Residency Matching Program. And we talked about introducing personal finance mm -hmm. into residency. The number one question that everybody says is, there's not enough time. Right. right. So now you're talking about now adding another component. You want us to teach them about personal finance. And then you also want us to teach them about, you know, to be well, to watch out for the sun. I'm not I'm yeah, just playing devil's no, advocate. No, right? I know. No, I, I know. I, because, I was because, there. Because yeah. there's. Cause there's the next question and the thoughts that I'm having is just like, why does the status quo exist, particularly among attendings and physicians, right? Why does that status quo of like, this happened to me, so therefore someone else has to go Well, because it. misery it's crazy. loves company, and that, that's a real colloquialism. Like, misery loves company. If I had to suffer, you must suffer as well, because then for what was my suffering? You understand what I'm saying? Right. And so it's funny because... That is very true in industry, but not true when we talk about our children. When we talk about our children, oftentimes, right, people will say, well, I suffered so that I could give my children all the things that I didn't have. I don't say that. I, not you and me personally. I'm saying we as a collective in society, people, oh, okay. many Keep people say there. that. Keep that over right? there. Many people say that. say that, right? Like. I, you know, I went through all of this so my so I could give my kids all the things that I didn't have so I could make it easier for my children, right? I could give my children better access. I could do X, Y, and Z for my children. But for some reason in industry, it's like, nah, man, <laughs> I ain't paving no way. As a matter of fact, you see where there's like there's gravel here? I'm going to put a boulder in here because there's no way that you are going to get through this path easier than Yo, let's, I did. Let's, let's talk about my second and third year. Remember my second and third year in the ICU? Child, I made a Yo. song for you. Q2 in the ICU, baby. <sighs> Q2 in the ICU, baby. Q2 in the ICU. I want to talk to you, but you're Q2 in the ICU. That was literally a song that I made for you. I know. I remember. <laughs> Yo, that, that second year. So first year, you are just a first year, right? Yeah. Just writing notes, scuts. And then second year, that's when you are in charge of the ICU. And, oh, my God. There was a point. It was Q3, 24-hour call. Mm -hmm. And you remember that stupid thing that we used to do. So you would, you would come in. The person would come in rounds at, like, no, sorry. You would come in at, like, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. This is the stupid rule that we as residents made up. The person who's coming in did not have to write notes. What? Rounds would occur at, what, 7 in the morning? Why? Just listen to this. Rounds would occur at 7 o'clock in the morning, and then you just start the day, right? Run on yourself. And rounds would have to occur between the resident who just came on and the resident who was leaving. That's if the attending is on time, right? Right? So <laughs> rounds, rounds start at 7 o'clock. 
the person who's coming on has to get there a little bit before seven, like six o'clock and so forth. Yo. So throughout the day, from you know seven a.m. until like five p.m., mm-hmm. you're just taking care of ICU stuff. You're putting in central lines. You're taking out central lines. You're you know doing peg tubes. You're helping out with trachs. Um, you're taking care of really sick patients and so forth. Mm-hmm. And like I said, this is a twenty-four hour call. Then at five p.m., no, like six o'clock. That's when sign out occurs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you are the most senior person in house, and you're usually pair it up with another in, with an intern mm-hmm. right right and then the intern's job is to take care of all of the floor stuff you take care of all the ICU, ICU. stuff mm-hmm. which the ICU was always busy right and then your other job also was to anytime there was any general surgery consults the intern would see the general surgery consult and then you would go see the consult right and then you were in charge of calling the attending and then if the attending came in you would operate which is great you get to operate but don't forget, you're still, you're still and, taking care of the ICU. You're still taking care of the ICU, right? <laughs> and the intern cannot take care of the ICU. And so you're trying to do an appy or you're trying to do whatever small bowel obstruction with an attending. And then meanwhile, the nurses are calling you and everybody's calling, hey, like this person is about to code. And you're like, but if I leave, my attending's going to be pissed. But if I don't answer, this patient's going to, it's just, it is so stressful. Yeah. So that's going through the night. And then you had to do the mental math of, let's say your case finished at like one in the morning, two in the morning. Then you're like... The person who's still on has to write the notes mm-hmm. for the next day. Remember I told right, you? Right. So then is it like three o'clock, four o'clock? Should I start Ooh, writing? Should notes? I write right? How how far how far in advance is too far in advance to write the note? Well, we're talking three o'clock in the morning, you're exhausted. There's probably like sixteen people in the ICU. You're starting to write notes. And you're just praying that your intern doesn't call you for a consult. Because what's gonna happen, right? Is if you don't finish your notes, then you're the person who's coming on is going to be like, yo, why don't you finish notes? Which I think is the stupidest it's thing. It's the stupidest thing. So you you never really had a 24-hour shift. It right. really was like a 26-hour shift. Twenty. So you do that over and over. You come home, you go home, you get a box of Popeyes, you go to bed, yo. That's it, yo. I was <laughs> some dirty rice. I'm going to bed, yo. We do that all the time. You see how much weight I gained and all that stuff? Shoot. I... And you do that because the, the IC rotation was like nine months and then it continued mm-hmm. into third year and so forth. Yeah, you had you had a little bit different because you know, I did a critical have... care fellowship within a critical care fellowship, basically. <laughs> didn't you? Um, were you not supposed to be in the ICU at one point of third year? Yeah, but then because somebody we lost, left. We lost the resident. Yeah, yeah, you lost the resident, so you, they ended up like, "Hey, Darko, you back in the ICU?" Yeah. And third year, third year, you're supposed to be trauma captain, um, so you run all the traumas, you make the decisions, and then. Um, if someone needs to go to an operating room, then you'll you'll be operating with a fifth year who's in house mm-hmm. or the trauma attending who's in house, and you're also that's when you're starting to do the cases on your own, mm-hmm. right? Like you're actually as a third year now, you're doing the hernias on your own, and right. the attendings are just holding for you, right. right? Not like at other programs where the attending is like cut here, buzz right, here, right, 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 no. like you are doing the incisions, you're <laughs> yeah. putting in the the mesh, you're doing you know all yeah. those different things. That you know I, I got it, but when I had to go back to the ICU, that was. Yeah, when you had to go back to the ICU in your third year, I was like, oh my God. I felt like somebody gut punched me. I was like, are you kidding? I can't do this again. So that was, <laughs> I had I had a, 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 so this was what, third year? It was all about me. This was like 2008, <laughs> 2009. And I remember I had a 99 Jetta, mm-hmm, a Volkswagen mm-hmm. Jetta. And I remember I was pulling out of my driveway it had a garage. I was pulling out and I wasn't paying attention. And I remember the passenger side mirror got like ripped off as mm-hmm. I was pulling out because I wasn't straight. I wasn't aligned coming out. And it was just hanging by the wires. So you can imagine. I didn't have time to fix it. I didn't have time mm-hmm. to glue it. I had to just drive to work. I let that thing hang and just hang in the wind. Like I'd drive like 50 miles per hour, 65 miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> the entire way from where I was, right? <laughs> from where I was, that's like a what, a 15 minute? It was like a 20 yeah, minute commute. 15, 20, 20 minute commute yeah. all the way to Grady, do the same thing. <laughs> and it came to the point where it was just like, you know, when you get like alarm fatigue, and you just drive and you just don't even hear it. You don't even hear it. You don't hear the alarms anymore. I let that thing hang for like, what, six months? <laughs> Six months, I let it, I, because I was just like, yeah, like I felt like, I was just like, 
I didn't have time to get it fixed. I didn't know who to get. I didn't have. I, that was when I was like, I got a problem. <laughs> Seriously. I, 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 mean, I mean, that's when I knew I was like, yo, I got an issue, yo. I for real, for real got an issue, you know? And I was like. That's what it took? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, because I loved it in that car. Not you loved, did, you really I did love that car. I loved it in that Jetta. And the fact you really that, did. you know, what, year eight into this car, the, by that point, I only had like, what, 130, 130,000 miles on it. Yeah, it was just like I wasn't. shocks of a tricycle. I wasn't taking care of it, and I was just like. Doo, 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 and, I, and I remember people would be like, yo, don't you hear that? <laughs> Like, drivers would be like, gun, gun, like, your passenger thing is <laughs> it's like, about to fall off. Like, yo, let me just go get my Popeyes on my McDonald's steak and egg bagel so I go to bed. And, uh, rinse, wash, and repeat. Do this again. Yeah. But, you know, it's just, it's, it's, um, you know, I wanted, I wanted this episode to be about, you know, recognizing, you know, the shooting star that she was, mm -hmm. but also at the same time understand that at this point right now, we really don't know what triggered her, what right. caused her, you know, to do this. So for me, for us to kind of say, oh, it's because of residency, we don't know. Right. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be responsible about, responsible about this. I'm just sending love, I'm sending positivity to her family. Um, this has gotta be an extremely difficult time. No, like no answers, you yeah. know, her friends, maybe even some of her co-residents, right. what they're going through and so forth. And that's going to be very difficult yeah. you know, for them. So I don't know if this is related yeah. I agree to with experience you. in I residency. Think, so. You know, I, I've seen some of the posts. Um, and some of the posts I will say out there, and this, you know, might be controversial. I might get canceled for it. But some of the posts out there are very, this is residency's fault heavy. Um and I'm not saying that residency may not be a contributing factor. It, it certainly could be. I, if I had to guess, I would say yes, at the very least. Um, it's a contributing factor. But we don't know exactly what was in her mind at that time. And whatever it was, you know, it basically, for her, she made a decision um, that was ultimately... Um, the one that ended her life, but, you know, I I agree with you. I think the responsible thing is, you know, to, yes, focus on the fact that residency programs, medical training programs can do better, but not necessarily pinpoint almost like a cause and effect, um, yeah, you know, I mean, for I this think, kind I think of we, thing. I think we got to be a little bit more responsible than yeah. that. And I do agree with you, like, this is an opportunity to really, you know, if someone from, you know, the AAMC or someone from ACGME is watching and the obviously counterparts with the Osteopathic World, like, they got to do, like, yeah. if you, if, even if you go back, like, I went back as far as, like, 2003, you can see they have notes yeah. on this documenting how do we get programs to really start putting in protocols mm -hmm. to do this, like... It's almost like, you know, the federal make, the federal government makes a mandate and mm -hmm. it's really up to the states to kind of decide right. what they're going to do. Right. So it's the same thing with, like, it's individually on the residencies mm -hmm. and it's individually on the attendings to make the change. Now, I'm going to sit here and I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie and tell you, oh, well, you know, if you pay off your student loans and if you right. try to get financial independence, you can avoid this. I'm not saying that at all because yeah. if you look, imagine telling that to an intern. Yo, listen, man, you just got to make sure you put money into your 401k yeah. and that's going to stop you from being... Yeah. What you, bro, what are you talking about, right? Yeah. Nobody's trying to hear that. We're not here to say that. Um, I, but I just think that there are solutions that you can do if you're in the academic world and I think you should stay in your lane if you're doing that. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are solutions that we can give since we're not academic and we kind of took a different approach. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, or, or I think for us, when I, I can speak for us and say that for us, we kind of saw um, that there was a certain lifestyle that was waiting for us if we weren't very intentional about what we wanted out mm -hmm. of our career, how long right. we wanted to practice, and you know how much debt that we were taking on, and should we kind of keep up with the Joneses and get a really expensive car and go on vacations and all these different things. But at the same time, not be able to spend time with each other because we're at work mm -hmm. or not be able to spend time or quality time with kids um, because we're at, at work, work. Yeah. or not be able to, you know, start a podcast mm -hmm. because we're, we're at, at work. work all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I was walking by this weekend when I was on call. There's a picture of like a little like I think it's a it's a, a Reddit message. And basically it said something like, 
you know, this person is seeing an experience that they had where they said, you know, I spent, a, I missed a lot of birthday parties. I missed a lot of major events. Mm -hmm. And because I had to work on all of these things at my job. And now that I'm on the other side of, of you know, my career and my life, I don't remember any mm, of those stuff. things that I worked yep. really hard on, yep. put in the extra hours. But you know who remembers all of those things? My kids do. Mm -hmm. And you know what? They don't like me very much. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, for the residents who are listening right now, for the pre-meds who are listening right now, for the attendings who are listening right now, listen, you are more than just that MD, DL. You are more than just that residency spot. Um, you know, you are more than just, you know, just that, your metrics, that pursuit, your MCAT, your, th your board right. scores, your, you're so much more than that. It brings you, it brings you to, it bring like when you bring who you are to the table, like you are dope and just know that. Mm -hmm. And I know that obviously that's not the answer if you are on the edge. Right. Obviously, please right. know that people love you and people care about you and there are resources out there. Once again, one of the resources that we mentioned right now is 988. There's 20, it's 24 seven that help is there for you or text the word talk T A L K to seven, four, one, seven, four, one, check our show notes. Help is available yeah. um, for you. And um, yeah, I, I just think that from our standpoint, our standpoint is sharing our lifestyle mm -hmm. and letting people know that we've had to make some sacrifices up front mm -hmm. in order for us to kind of literally maintain our sanity mm -hmm. and also maintain our family unit. Mm hmm. Make sure that we don't get divorced because you ain't trying to get half my paper. I'm not trying to give up half my paper. Right? Really? What, what, are, what do I want from you, Nina? And I'm not trying to have my kids hate me. Um, but, <laughs> what, that's but that's still, that's you, tough. <laughs> that's really yeah, tough. Like, even though, those decisions are really tough. It is. And, you know, you know? And, and, the, one of, and I'll just say this last thing. Um, but one of the things that I do tell my pre-meds is that life does not happen in a bubble. And th this is why I, you know, I say, like, I agree with you that we need to be very responsible about saying that this is, you know, oh, is, you know, this is what residency does to you. Life doesn't happen in a bubble. People come in with their own set of issues outside of training. You know, training doesn't all of a sudden you know, remove you from all of the other things going on in your life. Oh, yeah. You know, your family life, you know, the, the life with your friends, you know, any other personal struggles that you might be having. Life doesn't happen in a bubble. And so, you know, I, I say that all to say that if you have things that are happening in your life, you know, try to try as best as you can. I know it's very hard, but try as best as you can to recognize that those things are probably affecting your mental health. You know, they're probably affecting your mental health in ways that you may not necessarily want to admit, you know? And so if you can go to therapy, go to therapy. If you need to call a hotline, call a hotline. You know, there, there's, again, so many resources that will be in the show notes, but life doesn't happen in a bubble. And so medical education is not going to be the answer to your problems. You know, I want people to like really understand that again, like I want to talk to my pre-meds, they're like, yeah, if I just become a doctor, it's like, this is <laughs> all of what you just mentioned is what, what's going on in your life is not going to the go stress, away. The stress that you have right now is a stress that's going to continue. Yes. Even if you get into med school, yes. into residency, yes. and into an attending life. Like you, there has to be, there's gonna be a point where there's gonna be a come to Jesus moment. Right. Where you're going to have to address those those things. And it is okay to go see a therapist. Yes. It is okay to talk to someone about that. And it is okay yeah. to set boundaries. It is okay to yeah. set boundaries. So I say that all to say that medicine, getting into medicine, becoming a doctor is not going to be the solution to all of your problems. You know, so... Um, Again, that's just kind of some of the conversations that I've had over the years with pre-meds, but. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot that we can go down, mm -hmm. but I think we, at this point, we'd be kind of repetitive, so. Yeah. Rest in peace, Dr. Nikita Mortimer, mm -hmm. you know. Anybody else who's out there who knows someone, um, you know, who passed away because of suicide, we send out our love to you. 
Um, and uh, we definitely know that it's a very difficult time. So uh, listen, let's bring back the sign out real quick. Let's transition to the sign out. Or should we take a break real quick? Take a quick break. All right, let's take a quick break and then we're going to come back. Hold up. Before we continue to all my day ones, and you know each and every one of you who you are, thank you for rolling with the show from Jump. And to the new listeners, welcome. What's good? Where y'all been? I want y'all to stay a while. All right. So look, I'm trying to build a community here and I need your help. So with whatever app you're listening to this show right now, I want you to click the subscribe button. Then I want you to go over to Apple Podcasts and I want you to rate and review the show. And you may be asking, how does this help? The way how it helps is by helping the show to grow and rise up in the rankings so that it's easier for new people to discover the show. Now, what's in it for you is at least once a week, I'm going to be going through these reviews. I'm going to pick a lucky reviewer and I'm going to give that person an opportunity to have a 15 minute session with me where we could talk about anything from personal finance, getting your money right to just shooting the you know what about the show. So listen, remember, all I need you to do is subscribe and then rate and review this show on Apple Podcasts. Let's get on with the episode. Peace. All right, y'all, we are back for a real quick segment um, called The Sign Out. This is a a segment where we had way back in the day where we talk about... Bringing it back. Yeah, it's been a while, right? But we're going to talk about the things that we think you absolutely uh, should be um, paying attention to. Um, before we end this or podcast. Or just things that we shooting the shit about. <laughs> basically, basically, basically. Um, so you want to go first? What do you want to discuss real quick? So I... really quickly, I just want to say that there is an opportunity that came my way that I did not tell you about that might cause me to leave Docs Outside the Box. Okay. I'm thinking of becoming the next co-host up against Skip Bayless. <laughs> <laughs> Now I believe that I would Skip encourage Bayless, you. I would encourage you to do I that. I believe that Skip Bayless has seen my Shannon Sharp impression, and has decided that he needs somebody like Shannon Sharp. Now, let me interrupt in you. Like, let me interrupt you. Like Shannon. Now, don't don't <laughs> do that now, Skip. <laughs> now, Skip. Now, how, wait. First of all, how do you spell Skip? Skip. S K I Y U P. Y U U P. Yeah, Skip. Skip. Yeah, spell it out, Alfred. Skip. Skip. Now, Skip, don't do that now, Skip. All right, y'all. <laughs> so Shannon, that- Sharp, Shannon Sharp is going to be leaving <laughs> FS1, which leaves uh, Skip Bayless on his own. And uh, if, <laughs> y'all did, if y'all didn't see this coming, I saw this coming several Long months time. ago. Several months ago. I called it two years Long ago. Remember, I was ago. like, oh, this ain't going to last for a while. Yeah. Stuff. But um, they are leaving. So listen. Um, if you decide, I'll move to Los Angeles for you, <laughs> with you actually. I'll move to Los Angeles with you. So I'm just very interested to see who's going to be sitting in that seat. You know, I'm not a big sports buff, but I do, I do enjoy that show. There are just a couple of sports shows that I do enjoy. Yo, Shannon just be spanking skip. That's the reason why I like it. <laughs> Glad you got a great memory because you could ooh, because that's all you got. Mm. No hopes, no aspirations, just memories. Mm. That's what you got. Mm. Shannon spanks Skip in a way in which nobody else he that so the reason why I like it is because Shannon was an actual like Hall of Fame player right, right. and he does the work with journalism and it just it's yeah. that combination is something that Skip really can't compete you know, against. He yeah. can't compete against. Now although technically Skip gave him a chance. So right, absolutely. you know it, it's not like, you know, he right. completely poo poo skip. He, yeah, but he blew it out the park. He blew it out you the know, park. You know, it's so. giving somebody an opportunity, but then it's, it's their job to run with yeah. it, and he ran with it. For me, I just love when he comes with the goat head anytime LeBron wants to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or the jersey. <laughs> or the jersey. Or the cigar. The cigar. <laughs> or the drinks. <laughs> the drinks. Yeah. The drinks. So, yeah. But congrats to Shannon Sharp um, for. Yeah, Shannon Sharp coming on the show. Yeah, taking matters into his own hands and deciding that he's going to bet on himself. Well, we don't know that. He might be going to ESPN, so we don't know. Well, but he decided that he was going... Look, he could be going to ESPN. That doesn't necessarily mean that he's not betting on himself, right? Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. We'll see. Hold, don't get all like, uh, you know, 
Don't get all like he's doing his own like. Okay, well then the I won't talk. Let me tell you something. We don't know yet. I don't cape for celebrities because I don't know these people. So right. who knows? All right. So. Who knows? But anyway, congratulations, congratulations for him for making that decision. Because let me tell you, after that exchange that they had what last month or two months ago, yes, yes. It, it was time to go. Yeah. So. But but anyway. So my sign out is going to be T.J. Moses, Be Your Girl, the Catronada edition. That's Ooh, it. Simple as that. Excuse me. It's a bop. Check it out on YouTube Music, Spotify, Google, wherever you listen to music. T.J. Moses, Be Your Girl, Catronada edition. This came out 2013. Or so the, the original version came out 2013, mm-hmm. um, but the Catronada edition, I can't remember uh, where it is. But Catronada, that's your country man right there. Oh, really? Yeah. Haitian Montreal or Haitian Canadian. Haitian can- Canadian. One of the top okay. DJs out there, but he remixed it. And it's great weather. It's fire. Great weather. You are in clinic. You trying to get people into your clinic. You trying to get people moving around and stuff. Get patients going. Come on. Or if you're in the <laughs> okay. OR. You mean the patients actually dancing in the clinic? Oh, yeah, man. Why not? Dr. Milhouse, she has her patients uh, moving. In the clinic? Yes. All oh, right. Or she's moving. <laughs> Right? <laughs> or you're in the OR, you're trying to get anesthesia to hurry up, you know, <laughs> play that music. But no, it's it's a bop, is one of my favorites. I was just listening to it over and over again. I know it's oldie, but it's a goodie, yeah. and I love it. So, cool. other than that, yo, that's it. We are done with this show. Once again, please make sure you check out the show notes um, or the description on the podcast to find out more resources um, for depression uh, and or suicide prevention. And um, listen, we love you all. We want to send a shout out to everyone who's listening to this podcast on YouTube as well as on uh, podcasts. Listen, we're all a family. We all close. We here for each other. And um, if you guys ever need us for anything, you can always reach out to us. Absolutely. Um, but just make sure you check out the resources below if you are struggling. Yeah. All right. We love you. Peace. <laughs>